the recording. Yep. Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We are all about creating a capable diverse talent pipeline to get more women, uh, leaders of color, uh, all different ways that you can define diversity is how we define it into the education, economic mobility and leadership pipeline. We do this in a number of ways, one of which is we have an annual conference and last year and this year it's virtual. So this is a, a few weeks in to 10 weeks of our virtual event this year. But next June, we will be live in Denver, uh, the third week of June. So mark your calendars for that. And we look forward to uh, seeing you all in person after we have been so uh, sequestered over the last year. So the theme of our um, event this year is Reboot Resilience, colon, Rebound Remarkable. And this is the Reboot team and they're incredible. And it's my um, great pleasure to introduce Duana Franklin Davis. She's the Chief Executive Officer and the CEO of Reboot Representation. She has a collaborative and compelling visionary leading the tech coalitions uh, pooled philanthropic investments that enable Black, Latina, and Native American women to graduate with computing degrees by 2025 and lessens the diversity gap in tech overall. A lifelong technologist with a passion for increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech sector, Duana joined Reboot Representation in 2019 after working in IT, software engineering, and leadership positions for MasterCard, May Department Store Companies, and IBM. Based in New York City, Duana holds a BS in management from Purdue University, an MS in information management from Washington University in St. Louis, and a certificate in project management from Washington University in St. Louis. So we are delighted to have her incredibly talented and diverse panelists here and very much looking forward to this session. Duana and everyone, welcome. Thank you. And thank you so much for that introduction. We are excited to be here. Um, the theme, as you said, about the conference is something that flows with Reboot and is something that's near and dear to my heart and to the hearts of the other ladies on the panel. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Reboot and why we exist, and then I'm going to introduce the rest of our, our panelists and give a snippet of what um, our partnership looks like, and then allow them to dive more in detail with regards to the amazing work that they're doing. Um, so Reboot Representation was born on the heels of a report that was produced um, in, an, in an effort to find out what organizations were doing with their philanthropic dollars. And a survey was done of 32 major tech companies representing 500 billion in revenue and about 500 million in philanthropic giving. And those organizations were spending about 5% of their money on women in tech and less than 0.1% which equals 335,000 annually on women of color and tech. That's it. So that coupled with the fact that yes, the pipeline really was shrinking. And when we looked at the public data um, of black, Latina, Native American women graduating with computing degrees um, from 2017, those women represented 4% of the graduating uh, population in computing. And that number was not projected to double to 8% until the year 2052 without interventions. So for all of those reasons, Reboot exists. So we are a collective, we're a coalition of amazing tech companies that have come together and said, yes, this is something that we value and is important to us. Um, I like to say they put their money where their mouth is and they've invested um, to be part of the coalition because they know that it's the power of the collective that's really going to make systemic change and move that needle forward for women of color and tech. Um, as we, we look to partner and invest, um, we, the Reboot team, um, partners with other nonprofit organizations that um, have programs to recruit and retain women of color um, into computing and see them through to graduation um, and 
they can go on to be part of our amazing tech companies. They can go on to higher education and get masters and PhDs. They can become entrepreneurs, but these women are gonna be set up for success to be the future leaders of, of these organizations as well as in their community and have the opportunity to um, have those the, the jobs of the future that will help them um, with, with the wealth and gap as well as be part of what's next. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our amazing panelists. I'm gonna start with uh, Karina Weber. She's a program manager with F5 Global Good and the F5 Foundation, uh, in addition to being a valued member of the Reboot Representation Tech Coalition. She joined F5 in early 2019 to create its first ever social impact program, F5 Global Good. She currently leads nonprofit partnerships, the F5 Foundation grants, and their workplace giving program across 40 plus countries. Thank you, Karina. Next, I want to introduce Talia Givens. Talia is the Senior Director of Student Professional Development Programs at the United Negro College Fund. She is an engineer turned career development leader using her analytical and education to solve the social educational equations of today from K-12 through higher education. The Reboot partnership with UNCF created an innovative online platform for targeted academic and career planning support, scholarships, and one-on-one -on -one mentoring for Black women pursuing computing degrees. Thanks, Talia. Next, I want to introduce Jamie Schwartz. Jamie is currently the Director of Major Gifts at the American Indian College Fund and has been with them for almost seven years. She is a strong community and social services professional and our Reboot partnership with AICF provides scholarships and wraparound services for Native American women pursuing a bachelor's degree in computing. Thanks, Jamie, for being here. And last and certainly not least, Debbie Marcus. Debbie is the Senior Director for Breakthrough Tech. She has more than 20 years of experience designing and managing innovative education and technology programs. Breakthrough Tech, it is amazing umbrella programs and services for women in technology, and it takes a regional approach. The Reboot Partnership is specific to the CUNY Summer Guild program, a tech immersion program, um, but Debbie's gonna talk to you more about their um, amazing opportunities and regional approach. Thanks for being here, Debbie. Um, so I'm going to start with, with Alia. If you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your the, the, the BFF program, I'll let you tell what the acronym is. And talk to us a little bit about how grants and philanthropy enable the program. Great, thank you so much, Dewana. And thank you to Global Minded for um, having this really great conversation. Um, as Dewana said, I, um, I am a computer engineer. I studied computer engineering and electrical engineering technology um, coming into my uh, life after college and uh, was in telecommunications for many years. And so I have, a, um, and have quite a number of uh, other, no, uh, quite a number of other black women who were studied along with me um, who are hidden figures out there and they are doing great work and continued in um, technology and are still computing to this day. And so um, I support that work by the work that I'm doing now at UNCF through the what's called the Black Females Moving Forward in Computing. So that's where BFF stands for. Um, you know, everybody has a BFF, right? And, um, and we want to see them move forward in this particular field. Um, it's essential. Um, we see that the technology is moving rapidly quick fast, it's quick, it's changing, um, and they need supports. Uh, and so uh, the philanthropy, the work that we're doing at, at uh, UNCF through this program, we have um, over 100 students that, that raised their hand and said, hey, I'm a young um, Black woman and I want to work in this as, as in computing. And we wanted to make sure that we could provide them with some supports to make sure that they not only um, have a community that they can connect with, but also have the, um, the education supports on compu for computer science, um, computer technology, um, computer engineering, and all of those different um, data structures, those foundational courses that are important for them to succeed through the degree program. And so we have a, we launched an online uh, platform and community 
um, at UNCF for this community, for these young, pe young people. Um, and the women that we are engaging with that really showed us that they came into their, most of them, some of them did have computing before coming in, but the plan to be through this program has offered us the opportunity to provide them with tutoring um, and data structures, provide them with near peer and faculty um, mentors. Um, the faculty mentors are engaging a lot this spring with them. Um, we're hoping to even continue through the summer um, with, this, with this cohort and, um, and really provide them some more deeper learning, deeper opportunity to talk to, to practice um, before they go into their major um, coursework. Um, the majority of students have not started their computing. They, we, excuse me, our program actually has first year and second year students. So we, we work with freshmen and sophomores. Um, and that is where we want to make sure that that foundation is strong so that when they go into their really deep major coursework, we don't lose them um, when they get there, right? Because um, that's where, you know, sometimes that's, that's the, cut, the cut card when it comes to like, are you gonna make it or not? But right now we are seeing that the students are strong. They need that course support. They also need the community. They don't feel like they have our data and our surveying of them shows that they don't feel like they have that connection with other students in computing. And so being able to talk with students and learn about and learn and have a community that they can connect with um, definitely provides the support that they need. Thank you, Talia, for that. Um... We're, we're so excited for these amazing young women and, and to watch their progress. So stay tuned. Um, yes. Next, Jamie, can you give us a little more information about um, our partnership and program with ASCF as well as yourself? Thank you. Sure, thank you, Duana, and thank you, Carol, for having us here today. Um, so again, I'm Jamie Schwartz. I work with the American Indian College Fund and I was really drawn um, after working with a number of different nonprofits to the mission at the American Indian College Fund. And I'm very proud to work for them. And with this partnership in particular, um, my mother uh, did not go to college and it was very important to her that myself, particularly myself and my sister become college educated, strong uh, women. And so, and I saw that story resonated and, um, repeated and reflected in the work of the American Indian College Fund. Um, the American Indian College Fund, uh, we are committed to investing in Native American students and tribal college education to help to transform lives and communities across the nation for Native communities. Um, and what we really do is we look at any um, issue or challenge facing American Indian communities and then address the educational framework and infrastructure and programming needed to address the, those particular issues. And so with our partnership um, with Reboot Representation, we have a, an intensive student success program to support Native American women throughout their educational journey as they you know, study computer science. Um, and our goal is to uh, get these women to graduation through comprehensive uh, financial support for their, uh, for their education. Um, we also uh, rely heavily our program on connecting students to a community of uh, peer mentors and faculty mentors. And that's really critical in helping a student navigate some of the challenging issues that are facing them. And we try to also focus on identifying um, uh, women uh, faculty mentors, women mentors, um, also in particular, if we can, native mentors, native faculty and mentors, um, so that uh, the students have um, a support system and guidance with uh, folks that, you know, have some idea of kind of the communities that they're from, the different nuances culturally um, with language, um, and can actually help them kind of navigate um, their journey to becoming computer science professionals um, while being strong, strongly rooted in their culture and their identity. Um, we offer also try to connect the women to a variety of different career experiences, um, which um, the uh, team at Reboot has been so amazing um, in uh, providing opportunities for the students to, um, to you know, hone their resume better, um, 
develop their resume, develop other skills and, and tools that they need to have in order to, um, to emerge from college an employable graduate. Um, and then we also really focus on uh, engaging the scholars and the faculty mentors in our program to reach back into the community and engage um, future potential scholars that could be supported by the reboot program or other program. Um, we recognize that and um, we recognize that there is not um, a community of practice um, among our communities where um, uh, students and particularly Native women are able to envision themselves or envision themselves in a career related to computer science. Um, but yet there's a, there is a need and we um, really want to leverage um, the student experiences, um, the students supported by this program to actually inspire others in their community to also explore um, the computer science field. Um, one of our scholars and um, the need is great. Um, the last year uh, with the pandemic highlighted um, the digital divide in so many ways for uh, Native communities. Um, and in fact, one of the Reboot scholars currently supported by the program, while she's finishing her computer science degree, was helping to work for her tribe to, um, to help update and improve their um, medical response um, system in their tribal community. Um, so before she was even has her degree, she's already using her education and her knowledge to address the significant gaps that exist. And so this program is so important um, to for Native communities because the need for leaders with computer science knowledge and understanding is significant. And um, the last year really highlighted that need. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Debbie, please tell us a little bit more about yourself and about Breakthrough TAC. Um, maybe a little bit about Get Cities if you want. And then um, if you want to talk about um, how philanthropy enables um, the programs to be successful. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me, Duana and Carol. I'm Debbie Marcus. I'm the Senior Director of Breakthrough Tech. And I've spent my career at the intersection of education and technology, both in higher education and in K-12. And uh, prior to joining Breakthrough Tech about a year and a half ago, uh, I spent uh, a long time at the New York City Department of Education, where I uh, founded and led Computer Science for All, which was our effort to bring K-12 education to all the students in New York City public schools. And I've been uh, really excited at Breakthrough Tech to be able to think about what happens next while we're still working all over the country to provide more access to students K-12, to and there's a lot of work to do in the K-12 to space, um, really want to think about how do we build upon that and continue growth of diversifying computing uh, around the country. Uh, and Breakthrough Tech has a goal of growing the number and percentage of women who are graduating with degrees in computing and entering the tech workforce. Uh, and we know that it has been a persistent problem that we have not been able to grow the share of women, particularly women of color, in computing. Um, and we develop a suite of programs that address really the barriers faced by women, but also with a particular emphasis on women who face compounded challenges, whether that's because of race, socioeconomic status, um, because they're the first in their generation to go to college, or they speak English as a second language, they have compounded challenges in addition to uh, gender equality issues. Um, and we do that through partnering with large, diverse uh, institutions to really think about how do we systemically change how those institutions think about computing uh, and change the share of who is uh, entering and succeeding in computing in those institutions and getting connected to the tech workforce in their local regional ecosystems. Uh, so we started this work as a partnership with CUNY, uh, which is the work that we have uh, done in partnership with Reboot. CUNY is the largest public uh, higher ed education institution in the country. It's made up of 24 different campuses. Uh, and about a year and a half ago, we've been uh, funded with a, a generous gift from uh, Pivotal Ventures, uh, Cognizant US Foundation and Verizon to take that model and uh, look at other regions uh, in partnership with a, an organization called Get Cities, um, which is looking at diversifying uh, and building gender equity in the whole tech ecosystem from higher education all the way through. Uh, to the industry. And so now we are operating in Chicago, the University of Illinois at Chicago. 
Uh, and we just started a site in the DC area in partnership with George Mason University and University of Maryland College Park. Um, and the suite of programs that we work on focus on a lot of the areas uh, that Jamie and Talia uh, talked about, but one is curriculum innovation and the academic pathway, what do we teach, how do we teach it, and what are the policies and practices that govern who gets into those courses and who succeeds in those courses, uh, as well as uh, thinking about career access, how do we make sure that our students are prepared to get jobs and have the experience and resume credentials needed to get internships and jobs. Uh, one of the things we found when we started this work focusing on trying to get students internships realizing that our students, when we paired them with companies who said they wanted to diversify who they were hiring as interns, uh, they still weren't getting, we gave them resumes of students in computing from CUNY schools, they still weren't getting interviews or getting the internship. So we started a program called the Sprint Internship, which is a micro internship program. It's a three week collaborative team internship project that is a lighter lift for companies. So it's less of an investment than a full paid internship, but gives students a resume credential and gives students the confidence and belief that this is something that they wanna do and that they can do. Um, so thinking about the barriers, putting and shining a spotlight on them and then creating some programs uh, to address them. And then finally, I think uh, Talia mentioned the, the feeling that you belong in the community uh, that we can create among women in computing, both their peers at the institutions that they're in, as well as connecting to women in the industry uh, so they can see themselves as part of a growing community of women in tech. Uh, and I think, Dewana, you asked about how does philanthropy, what role does philanthropy play in all of this? And I've been um, thinking about like how to create real systems change at institutions that are frankly large and bureaucratic and really hard to pivot. It's hard to pivot a large university in any direction. And I think part of that is, you know, the, the programmatic support. So whether that's the staff or the stipends needed to make sure that students are paid for their time or the funds for food and space when, when we all fed people and, and we're in the real world. Um, and that's really important to have the time and resources to do things differently than institutions are able to. If, if this was part of what they did normally, then they would be doing it. We need a new investment to try things that are different. Um, but I think on top of that, uh, philanthropy helps really innovative leaders. We work with fantastic faculty and deans and provosts who want to make change. And when you have the financial investment, it's not just the programs that you can fund. It, it, it gives them, it emboldens them, and it gives them the political capital to, to push the change that they want to change. I think when you have leadership well and you have some examples from programmatic changes, you can start to get at the real thing that needs to change, which is mindset. You can change those hearts and minds to show that this can be done and you have the political will to get there. I think we can start really uh, changing some of the persistent lack of progress that we've been seeing uh, in this space for the past couple of decades. Thanks, Debbie. Carol, you can see that I, I am honored and privileged to work with these amazing leaders, Jamie, Debbie, and Talia, representing um, nonprofits that are, are really working to move that needle forward. And then on the, the flip side of that, um, I want to turn it to Karina, because uh, she's on the corporate, corporate but CSR side of the house, also working to make real change. And I, I have the honor and privilege of working with her. Um, she, Karina has been an amazing part of the, the, the coalition and a thought leader with regards to how we look at our, our strategies and our investments. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Karina. Can you talk a little bit more about what is this F5 global good thing and um, how is F5 using philanthropy to make an impact for women and girls? Yeah, totally. And thank you all for, I'm honored to be part of, part of this panel. I feel like I'm learning so much and it's so great to be connected with you all because I've heard the other side as we're going through our grant selections and all of that. So it's so great to hear it in all of your own words. Um, but F5 Global Good, I love how you say that, Donna. What's this F5 Global Good thing? Um, so F5 Global Good is essentially kind of the social impact arm of F5 networks. Um, we're in three countries, a technology company based in Seattle but in 43 countries, about 6,000 employees. Um, and I kind of like to call it the social impact arm because when we call it a social impact program, it kind of feels like it's very siloed, right? Like here's the program, here's the company, but we're really trying to ingrain 
all of our social impact efforts across the board. Um, we, our, our Global Good program is only gosh, probably a year and a half old. We actually joined Reboot before we were actually a formal program. Um, that's how excited about it we were and how convinced by all of the research that is you really can't argue with. Um, but um, FI Global Good kind of encompasses our workplace giving, our nonprofit partnerships, volunteerism, and grant making. So that's kind of the grant making is kind of what I'll speak to specifically. Um, we have three core focuses um, kind of on our philanthropy side. Um, one, community development. Um, two, tech for good. So looking at kind of bridging that digital divide for nonprofits, because we know it's a, a massively under, underinvested and underfunded area. And COVID has totally exacerbated that. Um, and then STEM education, specifically um, with the, the ones of women and girls of color. So uh, like I said, we were a founding member of, of Reboot Representation. And I think with, you know, kind of the, the way in which we're making an impact and kind of what's core to our grant making and, and our program um, overall, our grant making program, um, is, you know, the commitment of, of Reboot to women and girls of color in STEM. We, we essentially do that same thing with our own grant making. We didn't kind of want that to be a commitment that we just do with Reboot, but that's something that wholeheartedly um, we're committed to even within our own grants. Um, and I think what's you know, kind of unique with that, and there's so much research, I mean, the Reboot report tells, I mean, you just can't argue it. Like I said, it's, it's so convincing. Um, having the explicit gender and racial lens on our grant making is so huge. Um, so all of our grants um, have to have at least 50% women and girls of color being reached, so direct beneficiaries. Um, I would say 50% is the minimum, but we're always, you know, we lean obviously on programs that are reaching that much more. We do one application, one application window open that's once a year, all organizations have to apply. And what's really great about that is it gives us the ability to really look at apples to apples, which organizations are gonna be most impactful, which ones really align with the work that wanting to fund and support. Um, it also helps get away from maybe executive pet projects or legacy you know, partnerships and stuff like that, um, that I think a lot of companies um, can sometimes struggle with. Um, also with our grant making, we fund multiple entry points. And this is, um, there's just so much more research that's coming out about that, but I think that's a really cool piece because we know males enter specifically STEM, the kind of the technology um, education journey, much earlier. Um, and for women, it's so, it, it really can be scattered. Um, so we fund multiple different entry points, but more recently we're really looking at that higher education because we know that that's a really critical time. Um, that can be really impactful um, in, that, in that career and that journey. And then also partnerships. I mean, Reboot is a perfect example of if we pool our resources together with other companies that have the same focus, we can be so much more impactful. And I will say we are not the experts in this just yet. You know, sometimes we go through on our Reboot meetings of who's funding what, and we're seeing we're all doing, a lot of these companies are doing individual grants to some of these organizations, and it's, like, okay, we got to get better at communication, guys, because this is something where we, you know, again, can be more impactful um, by doing that together. But also beyond just kind of resources, diverse capabilities, amplification of our voice and our platforms, and kind of coming together for those, um, uh, for that work. And I think, you know, one thing that we're really moving towards this year um, I'm on this big, big journey to, to pioneer on the corporate side, really um, encouraging companies to give unrestricted grants. I mean, I know I'm talking, I'm speaking to the choir here. Um, I've been on the nonprofit side. <laughs> I've been on the nonprofit side. I've been on the government side and um, unrestricted grants. That is the direction we need to start moving towards. Um, I, I see F5 is really trying to, um, vocalize that and kind of more so of our why um, with nonprofits being the experts. They're the ones that know where their funding should go and who are we to tell them where it should go, um, whatever agendas we have. Um, and then lastly, and this is something that's, you know, I know a trend over the course um, as a result of COVID, but really reducing the reporting requirements on nonprofits. Um, 
asking the questions that we really need to know, um, giving them the time to, to report that, but let's not make it um, this huge hurdle on, on organizations. And so that's a little bit of our journey just in the last year and a half and kind of where we're, where we're moving towards. That sounds like an amazing journey. And I know a lot of ears are perking up out there with regards to the unrestricted grants. F5 global, you get, go to the website, take a note, there's process, yes. But yes, it's, it's absolutely what's necessary because um, the leaders that are here as well as leaders that are, are out there virtually know that um, it, it, it does take money and resources in order to really move this needle forward. And also um, to be able to do, make that systemic change in that fashion that we know what's best for each of our programs and what is amazing and works well for one program may not be the perfect fit for another program. So um, I think you're, you're we're, we're choir love. We, we're got the, the bells ringing on on making sure that we can figure out how to move that forward. Um, Karina, to stick with you a little bit, um, can you talk to us about your thoughts on how philanthropy and CSR could increase representation and leadership? Yeah, I mean, it's so critical. Um, I think we look at it as, I mean, overall kind of the ability to shape and influence the talent environment, um, ability to work cross sector and functionally working with women and girls of color in, um, in this work. And I think approaching it at various angles is really important. So not just the grant making, but also the volunteerism, bringing in our employees who have this expertise, who have gone through this journey, um, being able to you know, bring them into that, um, that skills-based volunteerism, which we know it, for the most part, um, research tells us that is you know, the most engaging type of, of volunteerism that people can have. So, um, and then I think also kind of the role of CSR, um, you know, thought leadership, right? Using our platform for good, speaking out against um, justice or uh, inequities, I think is is a really big piece. And we're, you know, I kind of look at the way I used to describe philanthropy was the the ribbon cutting ceremony and the check presentation, kind of that old school approach. But now it's um, it, it's it's developed and and for all good reasons um, and a much more progressive. And stronger partnership with a nonprofit. I think um, I think there's still a long ways to go, but I, you know, being able to bring in so many different elements of of the corporation. Um, Duana, you always use the phrase uh, time, talent, and treasures, and that's the perfect way to um, to be able to describe that and uh, to be, you know, truly impactful. Time, talent, and treasures is definitely something that I say often with regards to how people, individuals, and corporations um, can, can make an impact and, and move that needle. Um, Debbie, can you talk to us a little bit about what you feel your scholars need in order to be successful and how you feel the grants uh, you helped enable that success or will help enable that success? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, I think. First is uh, they need, in many cases, experiences that they didn't necessarily have in whether it was K to 12 or on the way to the workforce. So the, the sprinternship idea is what we saw is that students were in a catch 22. They couldn't get experience because they didn't have experience. And so we need to be able to give them the experiences that they need to be competitive, um, whether it's to get into computing uh, departments, to stay in computing or to get into uh, tech careers. That experience also gives them the confidence and the self-efficacy that they can do it. Um, we hear a lot that even women who are studying computing are not applying for internships because they don't have the confidence that they can do it or the confidence that they can get it. Uh, and so we need to help them build that self-efficacy by giving them the experiences that help them believe in themselves. Um, I think second is really, uh, helping them build that community. We hear over and over, regardless of what our programmatic activity is, that the things that our students most value in participating with us uh, is the sense of community that they get and meeting their peers and making lifelong friends or getting to know a woman who could be a mentor. Uh, and that that sense of community really matters in their 
interest in, in being in computing, willingness to stick with it, uh, and, and ultimately their success. Uh, and then finally, I think we need to help create a belief in all of the people who work with our young women that they belong there and that they can succeed there. Uh, that the past is not prologue just because you didn't have experience in one of these things does not mean that you cannot succeed in the future. And I think that shift of hearts and minds of who belongs in computing and who can succeed in computing is something we need to do with all of the people that our, our young students encounter, whether that's in the workforce, who belongs here, who should intern here, who should work here. Um, as well as who can be successful just because you didn't take AP computer science in high school. It is not too late to start to learn computing uh, in college. Exactly that. Um, it's never too late to start a career in computing. Um, I'm gonna, I'll throw that question also to Jamie and Talia, if there's any additional things that you wanna add as to what your scholars need in order to be successful and how grants en enable that success. Sure. Um, I think I, I agree with everything that Debbie said for sure. Um, I mean, relationships and community is a value in many communities. For American Indian communities, culture, the whole culture is centered around relationship. And so without relationship, um, there you don't have the last, you don't have, create the lasting foundation that can move the needle um, long term. The only note that I would say um, that I would add, though, in addition to what Debbie mentioned is that, <clears throat> so the students that the American Indian College Fund serves, um, 50, over 50% are first generation um, students, first generation college students. Um, almost a, a third of our scholars are um, single parents. Um, we have quite a few, half of our scholars that we support are non-traditional students. So they may be a little bit older, um, they may um, have come to college in, in a non-traditional route. Maybe they received their GED and then path to a community college and then path to a four-year degree. So I would just note that, you know, experiences are really important like internships, but also considering that our traditional internship, um, traditional internship programs don't serve a wide a birth of students, right? And if we're gonna change, um, move the needle for women and girls in, in, in STEM and computer science, I think we need to think about our, um, the ex what we offer, our experiencing, our recruiting, and look at um, you know, maybe exploring how do you engage non-traditional students, like not your 18-year-old, you know, like what about the single mom who's going back to college who could still do, could, could move the needle in their community and serve, use the, the knowledge and skills that they're gaining to do that. And the current structures, both within higher education and within um, the employment sector, um, do not really accommodate that. So a single mom can't pick up and move to Manhattan for a eight week internship, you know, with minimum wage, right? So how do we create experiences and path and paths for um, for all women and girls. And I think Karina, you mentioned multiple entry points. And I think it's really looking at how do you make those connection points. And that's, those kind of investments are really gonna, are gonna be what help truly move the needle. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's Jamie, spot on. Um, I will add to that, you know, being that uh, we are at UNCF um, and how we look at the students that we're serving in the um, black females moving forward in computing and talking to those students and surveying those students, um, the good thing is that they see themselves as, um, as, as belonging in computing already. So they're freshmen, they're sophomores, and they're saying, I belong in computing. They see themselves as leaders in computing. So at this stage, they don't see a barrier. So let's cultivate that. So let's, let's make their way straight. And I think a big part of that is not only what we already said we're doing to support them, but this scholarshiping them. You know, I want to give all 100 of them scholarships, but and through more philanthropy, we could, we could, we could afford to really give them all $5,000 scholarships. But a subset of these young women who are going through this work with us and we're supporting them, that we're going to grant them 
um, 15 of them will get $5,000 scholarships to help support their education. Um, we could do more, right? Um, they are, you know, they're, they're just getting off, you know, into their uh, academic uh, pursuits and we want to see them get to the, the last leg, right? So if we could scholarship them past the first two years, that would be even, even better. Um, so it starts with scholarship, you know, from the UNCF's perspective, making sure that they get in, to, and through college. Um, and I think considering that the young people already see themselves as leaders in computing, and from what they're saying, then we need to give them exposure. They want to know, what can I do with this? What can I really, what are the, the avenues in which I can um, start my career and, and build it? And so that's motivating. Uh, when a, a young person can say, oh, I see myself in this space, or I see myself in that space. Um, I feel like that was something that was missing from, you know, my undergraduate experience when I was, you know, going through in that I had really good internships, but as seeing myself in the long term of where I could go um, with my um, degree, I think was one thing that was kind of missing. I got a good launch, but not that good long, the long, playing the long game, right? Because um, we want women to stay in, in the field when they when they when they start, right? So um, I think that the career exposure, and we're going to be doing work with our students over the course of their time with us to with with partnership with Reboot and all the partners that are in the Reboot uh, family um, to begin to do webinars around who are women in, in this field, where are they working, what do the companies look like, what is the culture there, where can you start, where can you grow. Um, and they want to see that, and they need to see that now as freshmen and sophomores in college. Um, the other thing I think we can do with philanthropy can support us in is supporting faculty and and um, and graduate students to serve as, as near peer mentors and, and advisors um, in the in the college setting. Um, the students said that uh, the first year students are more likely to see their advisor, the academic advisor, as their mentor. So we got to really uh, work it with the colleges to advise and know what these career pathways are, what the, the course, what the courses are that they need to actually um, come out with the skills that companies are, are wanting. Um, but then we also need to have support some of our graduate students who are getting graduate degrees in this level because they can serve back as mentors as well, as well as the industry mentors, not definitely though we need the industry face and students to see themselves in the industry. But I think there's something that can happen at the college level. Um, and we're as a part of our program, we have faculty, uh, African-American computer science faculty. Um, we need more, would like to have more. So again, being able to provide them with stipends so that they can um, do this extra work beyond their regular coursework with students who, and again, these are students across the country. They're all at different institutions. And so we are creating a community where it doesn't matter what school you go to, but this faculty and a person who looks like you, understands where you're coming from, can serve and help support you in your courses. So we want to do more of that and be able to provide that. So philanthropy can definitely help um, in growing that type of um, environment and supports for so students. So I, so I say scholarships, I say the career exposure and pathways, um, internships, and then also near peer and um, faculty mentoring and, so, and financially supporting that as well. See everybody's heads nodding. Um, you, you touched on one thing and there's a question in uh, the, the chat that I, I'll just grab real quick from Tyrone. He says, what impact do you see employee resource groups playing in volunteer opportunities as it relates to representation and closing the gaps? Um, I'll just speak to it real quick from the reboot standpoint and you guys all join in if you have additional things. Um, but we see ERGs as extremely important um, on for two different reasons. One, um, from the standpoint of the students, they, especially students of color, um, they need to see people in industry that look like them, that have that are successful, that ha can give them guidance, and they can feel safe and comfortable asking their questions too. Um, with Reboot, we're in the process of setting up a mentoring program. Um, with all of our, our scholar programs, um, as well as all of the um, employee resource group members to be able to opt into. Um, so dot, 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 stay tuned. Um, and then I think also from the company standpoint, um, not that they should do this philanthropy thing because, um, because of the 
the, the moral aspects, that's most certainly, but they all want to know what's in it for me as well. And so employee engagement is a huge opportunity for um, the companies to not just put their money uh, behind something, but to have that sense of pride um, for their employees to, to be involved and work for a company that's passionate about the things that they're passionate about um, and be able to um, evolve that company culture and make that place a, a great place to work. Um, what else do you wanna add about ERGs and, and opportunities, ladies? I would, I would just add, um, I think ERGs are so important and really kind of a critical piece for that co-creation in partnership with how we're designing from the onboarding perspective to the employee engagement survey, how we're disaggregating that data, how we're really um, addressing those, those most marginalized and those kind of fringe cases. So we're really, because that's where diversity lies, is those fringe cases. And I think that that's the biggest piece in, in having that partnership that's really employee owned and driven in partnership with the corporation. So I think they're, they're such a critical piece, but I also, there is such a balance of the responsibility not falling all on them, right? They don't own diversity and inclusion and they don't need to speak to, you know, for every, um, every event that takes place or everything like that, that's not, them and I think that that's where, um, just based on a lot of conversations that have kind of taken place in the last year, I think a lot of corporations are realizing that, and I think it's a long overdue realization that their ERGs don't own diversity and inclusion. They're not responsible for it, but they're but more than anything, they're facilitators of it. Great points. Um, let's segue a little bit. I want to know a little bit more um, from the perspective of um, our scholars. What do you think organizations should do to ensure that the, the company, the corporate space is ready to support women from these programs to enter the workforce? One thing that I've often said is we're working hard to build this pipeline and it doesn't do any good if the companies are not ready to receive and retain them. So what, I'll start with uh, Jamie. What do you think that corporations can do? Uh, I mean, I think it's, you know, we've touched on this theme a lot. I think it's creating the relationships, um, you know, within your corporate structure to help guide and navigate. I think, I know, um, mentorship opportunities within the company as you bring someone new on to actually um, help them uh, navigate the organizational culture and also show how they might be able to contribute or even change the organizational culture um, uh, to continue the pipeline. So I think that's really, really important. Um, and, you know, part of that is really listening and hearing, listening and hearing what uh, the scholars and future employees are really saying. Um, and I think that, you know, that's not just for our scholars, but with any employees, right? But if you want the, the establishing the relationships, beginning the path of, of helping um, the student to articulate their future there, um, you know, focusing on investment, also in professional development, continuing professional development to help them stay at those, uh, stay within the corporation. I think those are all things that are really important to, to recognize. And I think, you know, considering our, our populations, allowing, you know, does your, does your corporate culture um, allow uh, a person to bring their whole self, their, you know, their entire self to their work? Um, I think, I mean, this is probably consistent across many different cultures, but I know that, you know, um, our students really desire to be, you know, they want to be their, you know, one of our scholars wants to be her strongest Navajo woman self. So she, can she bring that uh, that knowledge, um, her strengths that come from her unique perspective and her unique view to, to the company and to the mission. And I think that's really important to, to take a look at as well. Um, if I could add, I, I think it's, it's definitely starts with that. I, my, my work over the past seven years at UNCF has really given me opportunity to 
um, have that first conversation with companies that are trying to start this process of of um, really opening the diverse pipeline. They, they say, I want a diverse workforce. They see that our country is changing, our world is changing. So that's like, yes, um, this is great. What I find is that the companies that are really successful in this work have taken the time to um, do that introspection on what in our company culture, how is my organization doing right now? really honestly assessing um, my retention of people of color, people of diverse backgrounds, people, women. And, um, and when they have done that work, they come to the table with real goals. They know their numbers. They say, I wanna increase uh, the number of women in um, technology or in my company by this amount. How can you help us get there? Uh, I wanna increase the diverse talent by this amount. How can you help us get there? Um, they have they have some structures that they want to you know work out. One company I, I've seen them um, for the I think it's the first time I've seen this this year. But they kind of threw out their old model of how they hire, how they bring in their interns and early ta early talent um, new hires. They didn't even want to see the resumes until they got to the final interviews. What we saw on the back end was that students who female students even from Areas in which uh, institutions that normally wouldn't we wouldn't see the top of the top of the list get the internship were showing up in that final group of interns that they hired. We were ecstatic, and it was just a, a way of I was like, see what can happen when you kind of give a student a chance and an opportunity based upon how they're showing up. And of course, with UNCF in my department, we're going to make sure that that resume is strong and that they interview well, and we do our job right. But when the barriers to entry, assessments that really aren't assessing the real job, you know, when we move up those barriers to entry and not um, say that an intern should come in looking like someone who's had a PhD or five years experience, but really know that they're coming in, of course, with their education behind them, with their ambition behind them, with um, in, in, you know, in their job experience at a local fast food restaurant, right? But they're in college and they want to they want to have opportunity. So when they're they're getting that given that opportunity to learn, we are you can see the you can see the pipeline shifting. You can see the pipeline opening up, you know. And we're giving them uh, opportunity. And as Debbie said earlier, when a company has the position description and you're giving them the resumes and you're not seeing them get the job and you're wondering what's going on, well, there's some work I think that has to happen on the industry side to really unpack what they're really looking for, especially from the college to career um, group that we are all supporting um, in our work because um, there's a disconnect and we can't articulate to the company, this is, this is what you want, but they have to maybe think about it a little differently, open up their, um, the, the, the language ideas of what is the real entry uh, level responsibilities and work so that they're not missing out great talent because they're not, they're not getting, getting the match. I think between Jamie and Talia, y'all broke it down, but I, I have to ask Debbie, is there, what else do we want to add to that? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that they've hit on, uh, I think <laughs> most of all, or all of the key, the key things that need to happen. Uh, and, and maybe just one other to add to that, um, which is, uh, that the reason we want diversity in industry is because we know that diverse teams bring innovative new ideas and can get things done in better ways than homogenous teams. Um, but companies have to also be willing to hear new ideas and new thought and be open to new ways of doing things uh, if you're going to bring in a new and more diverse uh, talent pipeline. So I think that's just the only other thing that I would add to what um, Tali and Jamie said. In my seat, I have a great lens into what's happening with our corporate partners. We meet with them with regular one-on-ones and a lens into what's happening with amazing nonprofit organizations like the ones the ladies here represent. Um, Karina, can you share a little bit about some of the, the great work that F5 is doing um, to, to prepare the workplace to be more diverse and inclusive for the future leaders that we're fostering and developing? Yeah, and I know that we're kind of close on time, so I don't want to 
go into into too much detail, but I think you know the a really powerful uh, opportunity um, that I hope that you know we'll continue to kind of make a, a standing um, a standing event or whatnot. But we actually have our um, senior leadership team um, offsite, which is virtual this year, of course, um, next week, and we thought it would be a really great opportunity to bring in one of our nonprofit partners and really kind of the whole conversation. And this is all senior leaders. So vice president and above um, at our company. And uh, the conversation we're gonna have is around uh, kind of that inclusion for people of color um, within the walls at five, but hearing from one of our nonprofit partners in what they're doing to kind of prepare their students, prepare their scholars, based on what they're hearing from their corporate partners. You know, this is what we're doing to um, support diversity and inclusion, support diversity and inclusion, but, um, you know, build an inclusive workforce, but also with the lens of what their scholars are really telling them. You know, I think a, a great example was, um, and this partner is uh, called Rainer Scholars. They're based here in Seattle. Um, it's a 12 year intensive um, education program. and you know, these kid, kids, they graduate college and they enter the workforce and, you know, maybe they're Black. And immediately they're asked to, hey, what should we incorporate into our communication around George Floyd's death? You know, that was, you know, one example that they gave. And this, you know, 21-year-old is like, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to say? To, you know, again, I think it's what I was kind of talking about earlier of how these ERGs don't own diversity and inclusion, and that's the responsibility of the company. But this conversation we're having next week is with our nonprofit partner, kind of what they're doing to uh, prepare their scholars for the workforce. And then also hearing from students who have gone through the process, recent um, early career students, or excuse me, um, employees. And then also for our senior leadership team to be able to share some of the best practices. Um, and we specifically called out um, senior leaders that have great retention stats of people of color. Um, good, diverse teams, um, uh, uh, strong belonging scores or employee engagement scores, um, survey, excuse me. So I think that that's kind of an exciting piece to be able to bring in a nonprofit partner, the voices of the scholars who've gone through it, who are early in their career, um, and kind of that best practice sharing um, in kind of a, probably a really vulnerable setting. Um, and then similar to that, we're also um, hosting a session that Duana is going to be a speaker on. It's called Real Talk Blacks in Tech. It's on June 17th. Um, we're starting the registration next week, but really the whole conversation around it is so, you know, these are all leaders that identify as Black. Um, the question is, how did they create that change? But now, how are they holding the door open for that change to, um, to continue on within their teams and within their organizations. And again, it's just all of this vulnerable and best practice sharing um, across industries, across sectors. Um, and I think that um, a lot of this has uh, become more of a priority over the last year and it's, it's, it's exciting and I hope it doesn't go away. I think we can go on and on about and, and share more about our, our each of our experiences on how we are making change and moving the needle forward. Um, working with the coalition companies as well as our grantee partners continues to give me hope and inspiration that the future of tech will be more equitable, more diverse, and more inclusive. Um, Carol, I'm going to hand it back over to you because we're unfortunately out of time. Well, this was fabulous. And one of the things we'll do in addition to posting this as part of our 2021 event is we'll also um, post and link from our foundations and funders equity team, which we do um, once a month, but this topic has to do with those folks too. So we'll have it under both of those. And you guys made incredible um, um, insights and uh, just so enjoyed having you all here. And I think the other thing we have to say, you know, quite honestly is, you know, the tech companies made billions of dollars last year as so many people suffered. So what is the responsibility that we hold the major five companies to helping us, you know, fund you all, pay for college for these women and other, um, you know, underrepresented people who are so critical to the diverse talent pipeline, but 
through whom we've lost so much in the last year. So that there's really on that pipeline, there's just little drips of water and it, you know, it wasn't great before COVID. So I think um, in all of these things, we have to be able to say, where are the places where we can go to some of those places of power, places of monetary influence and, um, and get the support for the incredible things you all are doing so that you're reaching, we're, we're able to reach everybody out there and their families and those different, um, you know, single parents and other people that are part of the part of that pipeline chain. So thanks to you all so much. It's been incredible spending the time with you all. And I think what we should do is we should look at the calendars for August or September. And we need to do that other session that was brought up on how can funders uh, do more unrestricted funding and be able to set up their funds in a way where the people can actually do the work and they're not spending half their time reporting back on the very complicated procedures that some of the places, you know, require. So Duana, I'll put you in charge of organizing people for that. <laughs> but uh, I think you, you all are amazing. And we look forward to the Global Minded Inclusive Community supporting all of you in the work that you do. And uh, we can always communicate through each other and also through, through Duana and her team. But I'm um, very much looking forward to also having your incredible women be part of our first gen leadership class um, this summer and also come in person next year. Maybe we can do a pre-conference or something special with your audience where other people can learn from the gains you're making with your um, incredible work for your specific audience. You all are, are um, lifting up into these incredible positions. So thanks again to everybody and thanks for all of you who joined us and we'll be sure to include the link for everybody. And we'll also, we just did a student leaders speak report with every learner everywhere. So we'll include um, that report as well. And it's their advice to college presidents, CEOs, and policymakers. And they're the ones typically not at the table, but they need to be, we can't solve for them without them. So thanks again to everybody. And we look forward to working with you in more expansive ways in the future. And thanks for everything that you all have done. Take good care. Thank you. Bye Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Great. All right.